In a world where it seems like the cameras are always rolling, amazing events are regularly caught on film. This also means that tragedy is often equally well documented. On the afternoon of October 17th, 1989, there was only one thing on the mind of most San Francisco residents, baseball. Game three of the World Series between the Oakland Athletics and San Francisco Giants was set to begin at 5.30 p.m. Little did the people pouring into Candlestick Park know the Pacific and North American tectonic plates had other plans. 60 miles away, at 5.04 p.m., the two plates experienced what is called a slip strike. This type of tectonic movement occurs when built-up pressure between two plates is violently released as they slide past each other. In this case, the plates moved almost a meter and a half, generating an earthquake measuring at a 6.9 on the Richter scale. The pregame show for the World Series was on air, making this the first time in U.S. history a major earthquake was broadcast live on national television. Despite its distance from the epicenter, San Francisco still shook for a solid 15 seconds. During this time, underground gas and water pipes burst, reinforced buildings were leveled, and over a mile of the top of the Cypress Street Viaduct collapsed, crushing 42 motorists on the lower level. In total, 67 people died as a result of the earthquake, and another 3,000 were injured. The cost of the damages was estimated at around $5 billion. The strict building codes in San Francisco and surrounding areas are largely a result of this costly and deadly disaster. The word earthquake brings to mind images of the ground shaking, buildings crumbling and streets cracking. While this is often the case, many devastating earthquakes have occurred deep beneath the ocean. In 2011, Tohoku earthquake was just such a case. On March 11th, 43 miles out to sea and 15 miles deep, a beast far more frightening than any Japanese movie monster roared to life. This megathrust quake was the strongest to ever hit Japan and the fourth strongest worldwide since record keeping started over a hundred years prior. In a fraction of a second, this 9.1 earthquake released enough energy to power all of Los Angeles for a year, altered the Earth's axis of rotation by as much as 25 centimeters, and moved the main island of Japan eight feet closer to North America. While the quake itself was bad enough, the greatest damage was caused by the 30-plus foot tsunami it created. By the time the wave reached land, news and cell phone cameras were rolling. The damage captured was truly staggering. The ocean can be seen slamming past levees and barriers as the water progressed deeper into the seaside towns. Buildings were destroyed and swept away. Cars were effortlessly tossed around like toys. The wave was large enough to interrupt the power to the cooling mechanisms for three of the reactors at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The human and economic costs are almost impossible to calculate. To this day, many people are still considered missing, but the death toll is estimated to be around 22,000. The rebuilding costs will eventually top $250 billion. The Fukushima cleanup alone will cost another $15 billion. The cost of replacing the nuclear energy with imported fossil fuels adds an additional $200 billion. 
when history's largest tsunami by volume strikes history's most densely populated industrialized nation, the effects are guaranteed to be catastrophic. Two thousand eleven was a year of record breaking natural disasters. As the people of Joplin, Missouri found out, terror not only comes from the ground beneath your feet, but also from the sky above. The afternoon of Sunday, May 22nd, began like any other. Forecasts showed a strong storm approaching with the risk of tornadoes, but adverse weather conditions were nothing new to the residents of Missouri. Just ten years earlier, the state was hit with what would become the costliest hailstorm ever recorded, with insurance payouts clocking in at over $2 billion. Unfortunately, the events of this day would overshadow anything Joplin had experienced before. Late in the afternoon, a tornado touched down just outside of town. Storm chasers and news crews were able to film the approaching funnel and reported several smaller vortices spinning around a central area of circulation. As the tornado progressed through town, it consolidated and strengthened, eventually becoming an EF-5 rated behemoth with winds surpassing 200 miles per hour. The storm's path through town was well documented as many people went outside to film the event, and East Middle School's security cameras also captured the damage as the tornado thundered through. At its peak power, the tornado flattened almost everything it touched. The winds were so strong they tore 100-pound manhole covers right out of the street. Even well-built commercial structures could not withstand the force and were left totally destroyed. By the time it was over, 161 people were left dead and over a thousand injured, making the tornado the seventh deadliest in U.S. history. Today, over $2.8 billion in insurance claims have been filed. In a time where almost everyone has a camera on their phone in their pocket, it is more surprising when there is not photographic evidence of an event. This, of course, was not always the case. Photography and videography were originally expensive and time-consuming, making it far less likely that an unexpected event would be caught on camera. Live broadcasts of unexpected historical tragedies are rare and seem to carry a weight not often found today. May 6, 1937, the German airship LZ-129 Hindenburg was arriving at Naval Air Station Lakehurst in New Jersey. Earlier that year, the Zeppelin had completed a round-trip flight from Germany to Rio de Janeiro. At this time, crafts like the Hindenburg had been transporting passengers for over 40 years. Flying by Zeppelin was not considered to be a particularly risky endeavor. However, this meant little to the passengers on that day. Due to the headwinds and poor weather, the Hindenburg was several hours behind schedule when it arrived at Lakehurst. Despite being late, the ground crew was not ready and the airship had to abandon its initial approach and circle around. The planned landing style was what was known as a flying moor. This meant that the Hindenburg would drop lines to the ground crew, who would then wench the craft down to the ground. As they approached again, the wind shifted but the captain was able to correct and bring the ship to the mooring station. The mooring lines were dropped and the process of docking began. Four minutes later, onlookers claimed to see the fabric near the ship's upper fin begin flapping, as though gas were escaping. Within seconds, flames erupted from the top and back of the Zeppelin. There has been much debate regarding when and where the flames started, Unfortunately, the news cameras present did not start rolling until approximately 15 seconds into the disaster. Regardless of where the fire originated, the Hindenburg was quickly consumed and plummeted 290 feet to the ground. Though many were badly burned, 62 of the 97 people on board the Hindenburg miraculously survived in what is seen as one of the most notorious tragedies in all of history. 
Throughout human history, the need to explore has been one of our defining characteristics. Many of man's greatest achievements were born out of the desire to discover the unknown. Unfortunately, history has taught us that for every great high, there are often many lows. Few tragedies of exploration can compare with that of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. On January 28, 1986, the crew of the Challenger prepared for what would be the shuttle's 10th and final launch. It was an unusually cold morning, 20 degrees colder than the coldest day a shuttle had ever been launched on. NASA's lack of experience and testing at these low temperatures would have devastating consequences. In order to break free of Earth's gravity, the shuttle would have to reach tremendous speeds. This was to be accomplished using the solid rocket boosters that Challenger would essentially ride into space. Each rocket had four self-contained fuel segments and were sealed with rubber O-rings. These O-rings had not been tested in weather as cold as that on launch day. Despite the lack of testing, Morton Thiokol, the company that produced the O-rings, told NASA the cold weather would not be a problem for their product. During the ascent, one of the O-rings failed, allowing hot exhaust to blow directly into the liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel tank. 73 seconds after launch, the liquid fuel tank exploded, sending the Challenger tumbling at almost two times the speed of sound. Not designed for these aerodynamic forces, the shuttle immediately broke into several large sections and plummeted into the ocean. Later investigation found that the crew were likely alive and conscious for at least some amount of time after the explosion. Three of the four personal air packs recovered had been activated. Also, switches on astronaut Mike Smith's right-hand panel had been activated, indicating he had attempted to restore power to the flight deck. The cabin hit the Atlantic Ocean at 207 miles per hour, generating a deceleration energy of over 200 times the Earth's gravity. This would have instantly killed anyone still alive at that point. This mission was of particular interest because of payload specialist Krista McAuliffe. Krista was a social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, and was selected from over 11,000 applicants to the NASA Teacher in Space Project. Due to her presence, there was increased media coverage, and the launch was shown live in many schools across the country. It is estimated that 17% of the population of the U.S. watched the disaster unfold in real time and 85% of people knew about it within the first hour. To this day, it's still seen as one of the most saddening tragedies in American history. That's all for now. Remember, you may not believe it, but anything is possible in a world so seriously strange. If you'd like to help keep YouTube creepy, please check out my Patreon link in the description below for more information. And of course, check out another video and be sure to subscribe to my channel now, because you won't want to miss what's next, and I'll see you next time.